So this is probably our last uh, lecture here on color. Uh, hopefully we'll get through the rest of it today. I know we're a lecture or two behind, but we'll catch up eventually. Um, that's usually kind of how it goes. Uh, so that's pretty much it for the prologue while I was restarting here. So uh, no more no questions or anything before we jump into the topics for today? Seems good. Okay. Well, this is kind of where we left off last time. Um, which, if you remember, we, we spent, you know, last lecture and a little bit of the previous lecture talking about just what color is and, like, ways that we can kind of describe color, right? So, talked a little bit about, you know, wavelengths and stuff, what makes, um, you know, the physical properties of light, like wavelength, uh, you know, how that's distinguished from the psychological property of color, right? And then, as we were kind of finishing up last time, we were talking about uh, how you can, uh, what I, or what, not just I, but what everyone calls color spaces, which are, oh, so weird. Um, which are essentially like ways of describing color kind of numerically, right? So I um, kind of went through a couple of those, you know, um, there are different ways that you might describe color depending on, for example, whether you tend to show that color on a screen. What? All right, it's fine. Um, you know, so like, um, because you're, because your computer monitor is made up of like red, green, and blue little mini pixels, you know, we use uh, what's called a red, green, blue, or an RGB color space to um, describe colors, you know, for digital stuff because that kind of tells the pixels in your computer monitor how much to turn on each of those little uh, subparts of each pixel. Um, you know, if you were printing in ink or something, you might use what we call the CMYK color space. Uh, because we use cyan, magenta, and yellow, and also black uh, ink to kind of print stuff, right? So we talked about the difference between additive and subtractive color. But one of the color spaces that's kind of important that we kind of left off talking about uh, was what we call the LAB color space, right? So I kind of foreshadowed a little bit of this last time. Uh, and the thing about the LAB color space is uh, it kind of describes color in, the, in terms that are roughly based on how our, our nervous system processes color, right? So now it's time to kind of talk a little bit about that. So um, the good news for you guys is we, again, are not going anywhere near into as much detail as we went into for things like the LGN and V1 and so on. Um, we're just kind of hitting a few key points here, but it does kind of rely on um, remembering some of the stuff that we talked about for, for other things. So hopefully um, some of these ideas are still sticking with you from earlier on. Uh, so just to kind of refresh your memory, I, I started kind of talking about this last time. Basically, the idea of our, um, you know, of the LAB color space is based on the idea that you can you can characterize the different hues or the different kind of, uh, you know, forget about the brightness of the color, but you can characterize the other aspects of the color. One way you can describe it is in terms of like red versus green contrast and as blue versus yellow contrast. And again, don't worry about this part just yet. Um, so that's the idea of that LED color space, and again, I said that's sort of based on how our nervous system does stuff. So now let's kind of jump back in and kind of talk a little bit about um, how our nervous system does do this stuff. So um, I know you've all been missing talk about how receptive fields work. Uh, um, so I have good news and bad news for you. The good news is, um, you know, we're not going to spend as much time on this as we, as we did for like LGN and V1 and so on. Uh, the bad news is that uh, your receptive fields for color information are way more complicated than for like um, for non-color based information. I don't know if I've used this word before, but you know uh, the Greek word for color is chroma. So uh, I'm trying to think of uh, so if you if well yeah I'm trying to think of uh, a good word that has chroma in it, but I can't that are not scientific terms. But um, you know so mostly we've been talking so far about like achromatic or non-chromatic or non-color based processing, right? All that stuff we talked about with like edges and stuff in V1 was all just based on like how bright things are, how much light there is in general, not what wavelength that light is or what color we perceive to be, right? So we start talking about how our color is processed, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, so um, don't worry about too much, as we describe this stuff, don't worry too much about like where the cells are that have these properties, right? So I want to just get through the concept here first. We can talk a little bit about kind of where this stuff is is uh, done in the nervous system. So if you remember your receptive field stuff, um, we looked, we saw some receptive fields that we kind of drew like this, right, with this kind of bullseye pattern. Um, that like one thing in kind of the center of their receptive field and another thing in the outer parts of their receptive field, right? 
So this is probably our last uh, lecture here on color.